Hello, hello, can everyone hear me? Great, so I'm waiting for my slides to show up at some magical point in the future. Ta-da, hooray. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm from a search company, you might have heard of us. Um, you know, some value of search, I guess. So, um, who is this guy, why is he talking to you? I feel like I'm a bit of the wild card here. I know very little about Drupal. I know a lot about PHP from my kind of time at university and working on random projects and stuff. Um, so my title is Developer Programs Engineer, which means I get to come out and give talks and write samples and libraries and things like that. At Google, we offer, we're often described as the zeroth customer. So we consume Google's APIs before anyone else outside the world gets to, and we say, well, this sucks, this is good, this is bad, this is great. And often we'll take opinionated views on the things we ship. So we might have a RESTful API, but we actually ship a library that does the one thing that 90% of people want to do, right? And that's my job to help write those libraries. Before that, though, I worked on Google Maps for iPhone. It was a surprise to me as well that I knew anything about iOS. So if you want to blame me for your directions on your phone, let me know. Although I will give you a hint that mostly it's a glorified 3D renderer. Um, well, you know, you can ask me about that later. I previously worked on things called Wave, if some of you might know. Anyone were Wave? Yay. Um, App Engine, which, small plug, does host PHP. Um, although you have to pay us, unlike the other services. Um, Drive, a thing called Google Keep, and a bit on Chrome. And my job now is mostly to, to evangelize or work as a developer engineer on Chrome. So it kind of fits in the model of, well, let's talk about new web stuff um, and things that you, know, you may or may not be using yet. What are my goals at Google? This is my mission at work. Um, I haven't really worked it out, and I've been there for long enough that people don't really care what I do. Also, people don't really care what I do anyway. Um, I'm a, big, a little cog in a big machine. So, like I mentioned before, um, a long time ago, I ran shared hosting. My uh, distinguishing feature was that I had PHP 5, so that might give you an idea of how long ago that was. And people, you know, were like, oh, you run PHP 5, that's amazing. Your register global's turned off, that's amazing. Um, and also, I wrote, like, some sign up flow stuff, so, you know, fill in form here, go to page here, make sure the form was there, all that kind of stuff. Um, this isn't a back-end talk at all, I just wanted to give you my background. Um, I mostly write in Go now, which also has a cute, cuddly mascot. So, talk is talk, talking about the modern web. Um, what does that actually mean? Um, is it Web 2.0? Well, I mean, okay, this quote is from, obviously, you know, two nights ago when I wrote this, when I wrote this quote, or added this quote in, but Web 2.0 was this thing modernized, like, or, or, or described almost 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, in 2004 at a, at a, at a Web 2.0 conference, which went for many years and eventually stopped. And it really talked about the idea that websites used to be static and boring, and there was kind of an idealized version of the web, right? There was no crazy Ajax, there was no crazy applications, it was just like, oh, I have a page, and I want to tell you some stuff, and I'm going to link to someone else who wants to tell you something else. And it was simple, and the world was, I don't know, arguably like a, I sound like an old man, right? It's like a, the world was a better place when all it was was just tags that, that meant what they actually were and not were trying to be used to create, you know, menus and drop downs and crazy stuff like that. But, you know, I, the, 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 the frameworks that sprung up around those times, like these guys that I've bolded here, really took the really bare bones primitives that you had, you know, literally 11 years ago and made awesome things out of that, right? But we've come a long way since then, right? I mean, browsers were simple then. They didn't do that much, but they were pretty consistent in what they did, right? You know, um, the, the wonderful example of this is you had very limited primitives, right? You were using tables to make pages. And, you know, this isn't really the point of the talk to talk about tables and layout, although I touch on that later. But, like, people still ask these questions, you know? It's not a new... This problem hasn't gone away in the last 11 years, despite the fact that browsers have moved on from that, that period. And what's hard about the web especially from Google's point of view, is that when you search for something, this is what you get, right? You don't get, by the way, all of this is 10 years old. People just search for the first result and go, oh, that looks good, let's build that, right? Um, you know, when you search for Ajax, the first hit tells you to create this Microsoft ActiveX object stuff, right? And I know that working for governments and enterprises, you need to support old browsers, but IE6, really? Please tell me if you're supporting IE6, anyone, anyone? Okay, that was a joke, good. Um, and it was like, there's some other weird stuff that, that we've kind of moved on from, like you send data encoded like this and you have a ready state change event for XML. Um, 
But in reality, okay, the problem is, of course, that when I say we've moved on, what this also means is you have more standards, because we still have to support this old stuff in some cases. But, you know, we've got these bodies that help define new standards that browsers implement, and these things that have kind of come in, ebb, in ebbs and flow over the last 10, 15 years. I'll give you some background. Um, the W3C was set up by Tim Berners-Lee, who did the, the web, essentially. It's, you know, his org. Um, what happened in reality is in about 2000, 2002, uh, or thereabouts, um, the browser vendors at, vendors at the time, which was basically WebKit, although not Apple really, at the time, Firefox, Mozilla, and IE, set up this thing called WhatWG. And it's like the web hypertext application something something working group. So what happened in reality is, um, while well, you had this lovely, well-intentioned standards body that in the W3C, the major browser vendors, went, vendors basically went, this is too slow, we're gonna do it ourselves. And, re and the reality, for better or worse, is that when you're shipping 99% of the world's browsers, you can kind of dictate how the web's gonna evolve. So we have these two standard bodies. You'll find, if you look at things like the HTML5 standard, which apparently is now final, which I find a bit confusing and odd, um, it's sort of written by the WG, but reference from W3C, and like, they're essentially inter interchangeable. It's just they have a slightly different membership. Of course, now what WG has Chrome and effectively Opera is Chrome, right? But they're in that, they're in there too now. So stepping back to things like Ajax, you know, the thing at the top there is essentially the standard for doing Ajax requests in 2015. And I have a get, I, I would have a hunch that many of you have never seen this before, right? Um, but in Chrome 42 or whatever, you can literally go to a console, type fetch, and give it these basic parameters. And you can go look up the standard in what WG, you can look up Firefox's implementation, um, you know, whether Apple is making, Apple barely, very rarely makes any noise about what they're doing, so we don't know if they're doing it, but probably they are. Um, and there's a nice polyfill. And it, at the very least, you have this new way of doing Ajax requests, which um, still looks like what we used to do, but it's a bit simpler. So what are we fighting to get here, right? And I'll have a few more examples of cool new things that we're doing. It's not just about Ajax and tables, but I mean, how do we fight this, like the web is, um, these primitives that, you know, how do we avoid people using primitives which are 10, 15 years old to build their, build their modern websites? And basically, it's history, right? Like, IE people still, you know, when you look up uh, how to do things, you still get results for IE6 compatibility. I still get up, look up how to do the ClearFix hack and find suggestions about, oh, if you're supporting IE for Mac. And it's like, this hasn't been around for so long, right? The top guy on the top left isn't really history, it's mobile Safari. Um, it's been described as the IE6 of the web. Um, I'll get into that later on, but it's something worth thinking about. Um, Google and other companies struggle with Apple because um, the iPhone, for better or worse, is like an aspirational target. If, you're, if, you're, if your application works well on an, on an iPhone, that's great. But the reality is their, mar browser, their market share is not as high as Android, but Android kind of has shitty old browsers and like it's a complicated story, right? Um, and jQuery, to some extent, is part of our history, right? Like libraries like jQuery and other, and other bits and pieces, um, you know, this, this dollar sign thing essentially, you know, paved the way for this um, standard which talked about, which has document query selector and document query selector all. And in fact now, the dollar sign thing is implemented using this guy, right? So the speed's about the same. Um, you know, this is pretty marginally different. Um, there's some cases where um, it's very similar. Some cases where, like if you're doing get element by ID, this is super fast, right? Because it doesn't have to like tr try to work out what this string means. But the point is these libraries have been really great in getting us to where we are now. And it pioneered this idea of this little dollar sign thing, which turned into a standard. So it's great, it's, it's helped, it helped you a long time ago. But I pose to you that it's not so useful anymore. So what I kind of mean by this is your abstractions are bad and you should feel bad. I was kind of mixed about the title, but um, it seems to have stuck. So um, yeah, on the left here is what we have like 10 years ago or even how people still build sites now. Where we have a browser, we have a framework, we have plugins, we have stuff built on top of that. Um, you get this reasonably intricate web of stuff happening in kind of user space land in your browser. Whereas on the right, we have this idea that the browser is doing a lot of this work for you. So um, we have tons of modern APIs, and I'll be going through some of them you know, in, a, in a few slides. Um, and they work well and interact with each other very well. 
And in cases where they don't exist yet, you can provide polyfills, which sort of by definition work very well if they're isolated. Because as soon as that feature is implemented by your browser, the need for that polyfill goes away, and that particular feature becomes a lot faster. Whereas if it has this weird dependency chain, you can't just take it out of the system, right? So um, a good example was that fetch API, right? So that is literally, the polyfill is 100 lines or something, right? And what you can do is if you want to use this new standard, you write a website, you include its tag in the header. If that feature's already supported, it doesn't run. You can even go further than that and not ship it to those people. But you know, have an automated process where those clients get that particular thing. And as soon as your, your browser of choice implements that feature, the need for that goes away, your site becomes faster usually, and maybe better for other reasons. Fetch obviously is not super interesting, but there are other cases where this becomes more appealing. I, like, I just like this site, vanillajs.com. And if you haven't got the gag, the thing in the middle here says, no matter what you tick, you get zero bytes. Um, this is a few years old now, but I still think it's cute. Um, it's just saying we've come a long way in terms of like all the JavaScript standards. So to get to contents, although I've been talking for a while, and I think that's almost a third of my talk so far, um, there's some things I want to talk about. There's one thing I mentioned in my blurb that I, that I think I won't get to because it takes a lot of time, and that's a thing called Service Worker, which people might be curious about, but I might get to that if I have time at the end. So um, let's talk about web animations. So in the beginning, there was window.setTimeout, and it was pretty bad. So um, I have a couple of demos, so I'll be like switching between them. Um, if you want to move something around the screen on a web page, um, you know, this code kind of probably makes a bit of sense. You create, an, you create a start time, you set an end time, um, you set its transform to be a certain position along the screen, and while it's still pending, you keep running this animation. So quick demo, not very exciting. Let's see if this comes up. No, 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 no. Where are you? All right, let's bring a tab up and then. Come on, yes. So a little cute elephant moving across the screen. And one thing I'll touch on is actually performance, right? So um, this is the way, you know, if you run jQuery right now and you want to move something from left to right, this is the sort of code that it'll actually generate. So in Chrome, we can do this lovely thing where we say, Let's go to timeline, let's hit record, and we'll see that, um, you know, I won't get into this too de in a too great detail, plus it's pretty crummy to see up there, but you can see that um, each frame is taking you a bit of time, right? So this is one millisecond, three cells, milliseconds, eight milliseconds. So it takes about 12 milliseconds to move this, move this guy around the screen. So that's fine, it's animation, it's cute. You know, you can do a few more things like that. Um, you can now use this thing called request animation frame. So what's actually happening in the background is that little elephant is still moving. The page is in the background, but it's still using my CPU, which is kind of silly, right? Like, why do I care about this cute animation? So instead I can say, well, only call me when I'm ready to draw. Sounds simple. I'm not gonna show a demo because it's literally the same code, except it doesn't, nothing happens when it's in the background, which I can't show you anyway. This is supported by 85% of browsers. So one thing I'll be doing in this talk is talking a little bit about the level of support these features have and whether they have polyfills or not. Um, and I guess up, up to you guys as, as you know, developers or integrators or whatever, or even people who are selling stuff to your clients, is to what level of percent are you happy to, to match, right? Um, I mean, I read somewhere recently that you know, Australia still has 2% of people on dial-up connections, right? Would you still target them? Is that still, you know, so is 96% or 98% enough for your, um, to use a feature that you know, doesn't work anywhere else? So, Actually, I touched on this a little bit with the animation frame stuff. I actually stole this from a talk I have entirely on web animation, so if you're curious about that, I'll send you the link later. Um, it still does a bit of work, and that, that, that cost we saw per frame will still be you know, at 12 milliseconds or whatever. Um, interestingly enough, to talk, to talk about polyfills and features, um, request animation frame is a cute hack to do work later. So let's say your users have got their site open in a background, a background tab somewhere. You can actually say, well, you know, I don't want to refresh this page all night. Maybe there's some content that changes every five minutes. But instead, I just want to refresh it when they've come back to it, right? So I know it's ready again. So you can use request animation frame, not for an animation, but to say, oh, look, I'm, I'm in focus again. I can be used. Um, although then, there's a thing called the page visibility API, and I'll give you a hint. The page visibility API polyfill is built on request animation frame. But actually, you don't need to care, right? So if you want to use a, a thing, this API, to see whether the page is visible or not, 
you just include the polyfill, things magically work. And when they're actually done properly by the browser, you get a few nicer bits, of, bits and pieces. Like, um, you know, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but uh, you know, using the polyfill, you, it takes like a good second for, the, for, for your page to realize that it's in the background, as an example. But it still does mostly what you expect. So web animations is a way to programmatically in JavaScript just do an animation between two states. Pretty simple. Um, it's standard. It's supported by, I confess, whenever you see 40%, this basically just means Chrome. So make of that what you will. Um, but we have a nice polyfill that works basically everywhere. So this is a lovely standard, right? If you want to move something on a screen, you want to have a cute effect, you want to whatever you like, you can just use this nowadays, right? The polyfill is great. It works almost everywhere. Um, if you go to the, the link later on, I'll put these slides up, um, you can read all about it. And this is just something that people aren't, you know, I think, you know, we, 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 we as, as Google actually know, have a vague idea of where this is being used. And in fact, on chromestatus.com, you can go to a thing which says, what are the features that I've seen in use over the last 30 days? And this is aggregate stats for everything that Chrome, every Chrome user has seen um, you know, in the last 30 days. And the stuff you expect is, the, is at the top, right? You see like a form element. And for CSS, you see width, right? Turns out width is the most common CSS property. But if you're curious about where these features are actually being used in reality, you can go and look them up. So I'll give you a quick demo, but as you might expect, so okay, that's still the old elephant, which is still happily moving away, you'll see that looks exactly the same. The key here is that when you do your profiler and you go, okay, well, I'll go back to timeline, and I say record, and I wait, you know, a second or two, we see that actually, um, so this is a bit tricky, you can't really quite pick this up, but um, these gray boxes at the very top, which are really hard to see, show that actually the zero work happening on, the, on your page's thread at all. There's absolutely nothing, right? So the benefit of this kind of stuff in browsers that support it is that you don't do any work on the main thread, you move it all to the GPU, or you move it all to a second thread, which is great news because JavaScript's single-threaded and blocking and all that kind of jazz. Um, and you know, yet this guy in the background is still consuming you know, eight milliseconds per whatever, which is technically still doing some work on my CPU. And I need to, apparently I changed it. So that's pretty cool. So I'm gonna move on to another topic now, which is interactive HTML elements. There's actually only a couple of these, but they're really pivotal things that have kind of had, hopefully fill a gap in HTML. Actually, the third one, possibly not so useful, but there's three of them that I wanna talk about. Um, one is dialogue. Dialogues, you can have them. Mostly, they do a bunch of interesting stuff, but the most interesting part of this standard is the modal dialogue support. So you, you wanna block your page, you wanna let user inter, you know, type something in or enter something. Second one is details and summary. It's not as interesting, but it's cute. Um, I'll give you a quick demo to get an idea what these actually are. And yet again, let's get rid of this guy. So um, not much is going on here, but I'm gonna show a modal dialogue. Covers the whole page. Um, okay, admittedly it covers the inner page, so I can still tap on the code pen stuff around the edges, but I can't tap on this guy behind here. I can't focus it, I can't tab to it, I can't do anything, right? So while the page is still running, this is a really nice, you know, you've seen these forms where you can kind of scroll around and the, and the black box disappears, or you can tab and like click a link behind the box and things like that, right? This is a common problem. And now we've kind of been able to solve that through um, these spec bodies pushing through new specifications, and this feature, you can actually go and use right now because you can include this polyfill in your, in your browser. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty too much. Needless to say, there's, with the polyfill, there's invisible HTML elements that you tab to and we steal the focus from and yada, yada, yada. But to some extent, you don't have to worry. It's not built on some other framework. You just include it. And when your browser supports it, you get some slightly better benefit. Details and summary, this pretty much as it is. There's no JavaScript going on here. There's just a, a, state, a, state, a thing that has a state. So you know, I can see that if I were to inspect that, I'd see that it was you know, either set as open or closed. So these are fine. If you don't use a polyfill though, some of them don't fall back very sanely. So you know, details and summary with the, have a little, with a little opener, turns out if you don't have a polyfill, it just works, right? Because it's just content. But the dialogue, because there's JavaScript involved, you'll end up crashing. So you need to use the polyfill in this case. Um, standards bodies also add some other interesting things that are kind of obvious. Um, you know, who here is set display none to hide an element? Turns out in every browser, in, you know, IE11 IE and above, um, you can now just say hidden. It just works. 
Um, except, of course, it's implemented by the thing below, which means you can override it. So it's not always done implemented perfectly. Although that's the way Chrome implements it, maybe it's done better somewhere else. But it's still really nice. So I'm going to switch it up a bit and talk about HTML and CSS. <coughs> so um, I mentioned tables when we started. Um, who here has used tables to design a to do layout anytime recently? So you know, I, you know whether it's true or not, no one wants to admit to it. So um, I think that's not the question anymore. Um, you know, when, when I was researching this, I looked up tables versus divs, and the articles you read very much talk about, you know, div for this, div for that, and they mention, oh, you should avoid divitis. Try not, try not to have too many of them, right? With HTML5, you can have things like articles and asides and headers and stuff that actually have semantic meaning. But it's kind of a hack, right? Because you're, kind of, you're trying to balance the, 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 the right elements that, that happen to match your content that happen to also match your styling rules, right? So you're kind of trying to find a balance here. Um, one thing that's really interesting that I think isn't picked up as much as it should be is what's called flexible box layout, also known as Flexbox. And so it actually has 85% adoption. It's pretty good. Um, Safari insists on using the WebKit prefix, but if you, if you can ignore that, then actually it works pretty much in all modern browsers. Modulo, I think IE8 has struggles with it, although I dubiously call IE8 a modern browser. Um, and you can actually look this up later. You can go to caniuse.com and see which, which you know, um, browsers support this feature. But it's just a really nice way of, you know, it solves a bunch of interesting layout problems that um, you know, people have struggled with, with floats and padding and hacks and all this kind of stuff, right? And it's just, it's at 85% usage. I don't really know what other point, what other thing, you know, we as kind of the web um, browser support supplier can do to make it, you know, more useful. There's also things called grid layout and multi-column column layout. They've actually been around for a while, but they're still behind flags and they have prefixes. So like Chrome doesn't support it unless you like tick a box and stuff. Um, so even though there are standards, this kind of comes back to what I said before. Like unless your browsers actually move on it, being a standard is, is sort of worth nothing. Um, and for better or worse, Flexbox seems to be getting a lot of love, whereas these other guys, not so much. And if you're curious about the internal workings of the standard, standard groups, I'm very happy to chat about that too, but it would take a long time. So modern web design probably means Flexbox, if you're into it, plus, and I don't really know what to call non tableless design, because it's not really divs anymore, right? Um, to give you some concrete examples of Flexbox, by the way, um, and I don't want to make this a talk about Flexbox, needless to say that it can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, you can put a div in the center of something, woo! Um, or you can do what was once referred to as the one true layout, which is the kind of multi-column stuff that just seems to work reasonably well and has a sensible, responsive model. And you can read Mozilla's guide to this because it's quite good. Um, there's some other woefully ignored CSS features. This is stuff I just looked up while I was researching this talk. Um, CSS calc, supported by 85%, also supported by 85% of browsers. Um, the top one's not very interesting because it's just boring math, but as you get to different units, it becomes super cool, right? Because you can say, well, I have this box, it needs to be this high, but also I have a header, which is a different unit type, and stuff like that. Um, current color, this is a really random, cute, small feature. If you have a color, but you want your background or your border color to be the same as it, you just say current color. I did not know about that one, despite it being the most, one of the most well-supported features that I'm talking about. Um, and it's cute, I don't really know if it, it, you need it in a land of SAS and, and less and all these libraries, but it, you know, it shows that you, know, you can Google for this term and you can, and you can see that you know, there's articles from 2011 saying, oh, we don't know if browsers will support this and, and you know, it's a cool new feature, but you know, don't place your bets on it. And admittedly, three years is a long time, but you know, it's pretty nice to see that articles from three years ago can become fact and browsers can pick them up and actually you know, do bother to build, implement these things. Um, and box sizing is cool too. Um, if you don't know about it, it's really nice. If you have like a box, a, 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 an element which has you know, a width of 100, you know, and you add a border of one pixel, does that mean the box is 102 pixels wide or is 100? Um, this just solves that problem and moves the, the border inside the box as opposed to outside. So I wanna talk a bit about web components. Um, people have talked, the talks I've been to today have talked a lot about components and um, various different terms for that. Um, obviously CSS is a big part of that, right? You have some object, you wanna style it in a certain way. Um, it's probably, web components, you know, I would take this, this, this Wikipedia quote with a grain of salt. Um, it's not quite just Google doing this stuff, but um, let me get into it in a little second. So um, if you use GitHub today, every single page you load has web components on it. So 
it's not very exciting, but the times you see in the revision logs, this is what it comes down to, this is what you get from the server. You get absolute dates and you get a reasonable default. Um, and then it upgrades to something useful via a custom element. So um, it then modifies its content to say seven months ago. Pretty simple, pretty cute. Um, I guess now that I think about it, they could just send you that text, but um, for better or worse, this is the way they've done it, and I think it's quite cute. It's probably a bit too encapsulated because really it's not doing a whole lot of stuff here, right? It's just, I've got a bit of text, I want to change it to some other text. You can imagine people using this for localization, although that comes into a whole other suite of issues and I don't know much about that, so don't you know, go away and start doing all your local localization via HTML custom elements. And the odd thing too is if you replace it with a bunch of DOM, then kind of that DOM inside that element becomes a bit weird, like does your, um, if you have someone building a component, do they need to care that you know, your web developer can now can get inside that DOM and muck with your internal workings? Um, I'll come back on that to the second, but um, what Google thinks of web components and what other people think I think of well is a good example is things like a button, but a bad example is a thing like a whole application, right? Your whole application doesn't need to be encapsulated. You've got the DOM and the HTML for that. But you know, a good example is something that's small and neat and doesn't have much state, and you can reuse it everywhere. So having your own button type might be cute, and you might say, I don't know, by default it says click me. Um, there's some examples which I think I'm going on a little, little bit, so um, you can look at these later, but there's a Pokemon element which you say, you know, X Pokemon name equals, I don't know, someone give me a Pokemon. Right, and it just shows you a picture. And that's it, it's dumb, but it shows you that this is quite powerful. You can then include that in your page and just use it as a reusable component. There's no worries about CSS or anything else, it just shows up and works. Support, of course, is a bit lackluster, and this is where I get back to talking about polyfills and stuff. Um, Firefox does some of the stuff. Chrome effectively is Opera now, so you know that's not worth mentioning. Um, in theory, we support polyfills for all these things, and Google ships these. Um, the issue here, and I won't get into details too much, is mobile Safari struggles a little bit. Um, the other browsers are mostly pretty good. Um, Google has an interesting take on web components, and this is what I was saying before. So we're betting, betting on this thing called Shadow, Shadow DOM, which is basically a way of saying, if I have an HTML element, how do I um, create a bunch of presentation or, or, or sort of layout DOM within that element that does something sensible without exposing that to my actual end user? And the user in this case, I guess, is you guys as the, as the developer. So your button has a bunch of div and spans and blah, blah, blah to make it look what, like it does. Um, a, good way to th a good example of this is Google's Polymer elements, and this is the thing up at the very right. Our material design slash Polymer stuff has this cute effect where you tap and it gets a bubble and a ripple, right? So we can use Shadow DOM to encapsulate that and hide that from you as a developer. So you don't care that the thing has a, has a bubble or a ripple, you just care that it's a button. So we're, we're betting, betting big, big on that. But it's a hugely expensive polyfill and we have to do things like replace query selector and things like that. So other approaches that you might have heard about, um, Facebook has a thing called React, which has kind of been in, in the news a lot lately. There's also a thing called Ember, which is another approach to web components. Um, the, what these do is they take sort of custom elements that you, you might describe and then they actually render them to DOM. And you basically remove that original thing from your, from your HTML page and then you get um, totally different DOM. The challenge there is that if you want to treat this custom element like a real element and do query selector and modify its properties, it's just gone, right? You can't get, get, get back to it. So you really end up moving a lot of your page's logic into pure JavaScript rather than treating the DOM as a, as a representation of your um, content or your, um, well, I guess your content, yeah. Um, and it gets a bit tricky when you have like sub-levels of this, right? So this thing at the bottom might become this huge long string of DOM and I can't get to this object called my container anymore. Where is it, right? So actually I will show a quick example because I feel like maybe it's useful to see a custom element in practice. Um, this is something that I'm keen to show off, which is something I wrote recently. This is called the mobile first element. And all it is is a phone you can drag around. And the idea is when you're actually on a mobile device, it literally hides itself and doesn't do anything. So it frees you from the uh, draconian ability to have to, actually I've got to reload, um, to have to build for mobile and desktop, down desktop. You just tell your desktop users, well, it's meant to be used on a phone, have fun. But this is something that when you look at the source code, if I can work out how to do that, um, well, 
Okay, this is a bit tricky to show, but it's literally two tags. And you don't see any of that, that weird phone stuff or the rotation logic or anything like that. Um, let's get back to it. So one thing I want to talk about, which is a bit odd for this talk, is I think is form validation. And this is actually one of the things I started with, with this whole, um, you know, what does the modern web do? And I thought about, you know, web components are a big part of that because they help you encapsulate a logical logic in, in a single DOM element. And web animations is cool because it takes these primitives that we've had a long time and then creates whole new ones that, you know, don't run on the CPU and things like that. But I find that form validation is something that people tend to overthink. And part of that is because you get these results, which look like they are from a long time ago. So when you search for form validation in your favorite browser, uh, favorite search engine, sorry, um, you get all these examples. And honestly, most of the time, these are just too complicated, right? You've got to add JavaScript. And maybe you've got jQuery anyway. Maybe you've got Angular anyway. But it's cognitive load you're adding to your page. This is most of what people need. And this works in... I even got, haven't even put this out up here because I think it's 95, 96%. You just literally say, if someone has to type this thing in, put a required tag on it, and you'll find that nearly every browser will say, well, you can't submit this without this data. And you're done. No JavaScript, no nothing. Um, like, I, like I hinted at, Angular is also a culprit, right? Google ships Angular, and we also have these you know, complicated examples. Um, this is, I won't go through all of this right now, but. Essentially, you know, I can have a, a warning class that, a, a warning tag that tells you, you know, what I need to do, um, you know, in addition to the browser's default little pop-up, that I can style based on a CSS selector. So if the user hasn't typed their, their name in here, I just get a notice. And so I can give a quick demo of that. Um, and, you know, it's pretty much as you expect. I hit submit, and I get a bunch of warnings. And this is very little code. And mostly it's just done with these required tags and a bit of CSS. You can't do everything, you know, if you want one of one, one or this A or B, but it's one of these cases where, you know, this has been, you've had so few primitives for so long that people have built all these huge libraries to actually, you know, emulate the behavior you really want. And apparently I'm tapping through, which is probably a sign that I'm, I'm just going through it. So there's a few validation options, things like length, pattern, um, there's even a site on the web right, right now where you can search for, um, you know, custom patterns, right? If you want a pattern to match an Amex credit card number or something, you can look that up. Um, so final thoughts, and I hope they've given you some examples of, of cool new stuff plus some reasons why you might just embrace the new kind of standards that we have now. Um, pick and choose your support. Like I said this before, right? Like if you see a site saying, by the way, for IE Mac, you need to do this, like maybe you're at the wrong site. Maybe it's a bit out of date. And even IE8, which I think we struggle with, and Google, for example, um, we struggle with IE8 because things like the Maps API, which is built in Sydney, and I sit next, right next to, next to these guys, still has to support IE8. It's actually interesting because IE8 actually wasn't that bad as a browser, but it was very bad at adopting standards. So it actually works really well, just all the names of things are really wrong. So to that end, you can actually polyfill a lot of those mistakes away. Technically, there's still some memory issues and it might be a bit slower, but if all you're worried about is just making sure that people, you know, that your site doesn't blow up on these browsers, then you can mostly solve that with things like polyfills. And I think in many cases, the reason people don't use new features is because they're worried about that 1% or 2% or that 5% who they think are still very valuable. Well, what if you can say, we can still support them, the experience won't be quite as good as we, you know, give to everyone else, but it won't explode, it won't die, they won't get a blank page when they load, when they load our site. In this case, you know, these are the sort, of, the sort of battles you can win with polyfills, especially when you're talking about polyfills back to IE8. There's certainly the class of polyfill like web animations, which on modern browsers run, runs very fast. But certainly for any old features or any old browsers, you can mostly solve this with JavaScript and, and libraries that you drag in as well. <coughs> so when this goes up later, there's some links. Um, and that's it. Hey, there's a mic as well if you want to. Apparently, I'm being recorded. Oh, sorry, I can read. Uh, yeah. What is the difference between the Polymer uh, Shadow DOM yep. and the other three? Like, because you said like, it's very expensive. So, what is, what is actually, how much is that? Um, so, on browsers that support it, it's great. And of course, that's Chrome. And you know, I stand, I stand up here. I'm not standing up here saying Chrome is the be all and end all, but obviously, you know, I'm wearing my Google shirt, and you can make of that what you will. Um, 
so the reason we do Shadow DOM is really to hide the internal workings of these elements, right? That's the key of it. Whereas the other approaches have taken a more pragmatic approach and said, well, we can't solve this anytime soon and we want to be faster, so we're going to add all the cruft that represents the, the inner workings of this to your page. Um, there's a few, I don't know for how many of you have done computer science as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a background, but there's a few kind of ON squared type operations in the Shadow DOM polyfill. Um, and we kind of, we almost go back to the, the place we started with jQuery and things like that for the dollar sign, which was doing some manual traversal and things like that. So it's not amazing. And I, you know, I can, honestly, I, I can't give you exact figures because it depends on your usage, but I would recommend you go look it up and, and make your own informed decision about whether this is a good idea or not. Um, things like the Google I.O. website, for instance, um, if you're curious, is entirely Polymer, right? So you can try loading that in, in Chrome versus another browser and see if you feel a difference there. Because um, this is a real life site that is entirely built with material design in Polymer that people use all the time, you know, that people will be, will be hitting a ton in the next few months trying to get tickets and stuff. And... <clears throat> Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I'll be around. Feel free to grab me about Google or anything else you want to talk about.